workforce in every single individual. One has to uh, talk in terms of group of individuals here, uh, but it clearly works uh, in a group. Now, I don't worry nearly as much about cholesterol. I think these books of cholesterol-lowering diets, et cetera, uh, really the word should be uh, uh, fat-lowering. Um, I realize that cholesterol is a fat. This is non-cholesterol fat on this side. But the amount of cholesterol most of us take in a day is only about a half a gram, whereas most of us take in each day at least 100 grams of non-cholesterol fat and many of us take in as much as 150 or 175 grams. If we eliminated the eggs, we'd eliminate half of the cholesterol we take in. If we eliminated the red meat, we'd eliminate uh, nearly a third uh, of the other. The fat, uh, about a third of it comes from red meat and about 40 plus percent uh, from fats and oils. This is the thing that I worry about the most. Now, of course, not all fats are bad. The bad one is the saturated fat, and the saturated fats are those that increase the total cholesterol. We all know what they are, primarily animals uh, that we eat. Uh, the other is the vegetable oil come from coconut or palm, and that's about it. Uh, the way to identify saturated fat, if you have oil or grease in a skillet and, and you let it sit out, to, uh, cools to warm temperature, if it's hard, it's bad, it's saturated. Now, the stores don't have the word saturated uh, in, the, in the stores. They use the word hydrogenated. And that just means that all these carbon atoms of a saturated fat are covered by hydrogen. And if you see the word hydrogenated, don't, don't buy it. If it solidifies, throw it away. Don't eat it. Polyunsaturated, monounsaturated uh, are good for us, but they're very high caloric. We have to keep that in mind. They either decrease our total cholesterol and LDL, or at least they have a neutral effect. And here that's soft or liquid at room temperature. Now, I think patients can understand that. Um, these long lists of good foods and bad foods, I have a problem with that. I think we need to supply more uh, principles of, of these, uh, uh, these nutrition principles. Now, one of the good thing about uh, uh, our bodies, it seems to me, at least mine, my taste buds can be food. I can't tell the difference, for example, between coconut oil and sunflower oil. Now, this one is about the worst thing we can put in our mouth. Coconut oil is 92% saturated fat. That is just awful. Palm kernel oil is 86%. Butter fat is 66% saturated fat. Beef tallow is just over half percent. Palm oil, 51%. Now, these on this side uh, are good for us. Uh, our grandmothers were right. Look at this. Olive oil is 77% monounsaturated. And there's some evidence that monounsaturated may be a bit better for us than polyunsaturated. Peanut oil is, is very high in monounsaturated. So a simple substitution of these for these uh, might improve our health a good bit. All animals have cholesterol. Anytime we eat a fish or any other kind of animal, we're taking in cholesterol. And gram for gram, fish and red meat are not quite very different from a cholesterol content. No plants have cholesterol, so anytime we eat a vegetable uh, uh, or fruit, we're not taking in cholesterol. All animals have saturated fat except fish, and that's one of the advantages of fish. Not that it doesn't have cholesterol in it, but it doesn't have saturated fat. The only plants with significant amount of saturated fat are coconut oil and palm oil. At room temperature, saturated fat is solid and unsaturated fat uh, is liquid. Now, as you know, the fast food industry in this country is a big deal. It's over a $60 billion industry. 20% of all Americans eat their lunch every day at a fast food chain, 13% their supper, and 5% uh, their breakfast every day. These two people, Michael Jacobson and Sarah Fritchman, went around to the top uh, 15 fast food chains and would order foods and uh, they wanted to learn the ingredients of the particular foods and they would ask the waiters and waitresses after they would order some, what uh, are the ingredients in this particular food? And most would say they didn't know. And some would go back to the kitchen and bring out those barrels that the foods came in and the ingredients would be on the outside. And some of the waiters and waitresses would ask them, what does that word ingredients mean? And, and that's about where we are uh, in, in some of this stuff. Now, let's take a peek uh, at, at some of these fast foods. Uh, this is Wendy's Triple Cheeseburger. That, that's, the, uh, that's the coronary artery bypass special right there. 
Uh, the, look at the calorie count here. We, in, in, in Wendy's triple cheeseburger, we're talking about over a thousand calories. The Burger King double beef whopper with cheese, it's getting up there. It's nearly a thousand. And if we take either one of those hamburgers and squeeze them real hard, we can come up with 15 teaspoons of fat, most of which is saturated. And that word right there is not salt, it's not sodium chloride, it's sodium alone. And look at the amount of sodium in some of the champs here, 1,200 to 1,800 milligrams in that one hamburger. Now, of course, we have to have some French fries with our hamburger. Uh, you know, a baked potato is one of the best things we need. It's uh, roughly 100 calories. It's 1% fat. But if you chop it up and cook it in beef tallow, most of these places cook it in beef tallow, 52% uh, fat. Good old Taco Bell, until very recently, cooked their French fries into none other than coconut oil, 92% saturated fat. Hardee's does a pretty good job. It can quadruple the calories in a baked potato. Another five teaspoons of saturated fat and over 300 milligrams of sodium. Now, of course, we've got to have something to drink with our hamburger and French fries. The queen or the, is Dairy Queen chocolate shake, large 20 fluid, uh, nearly another thousand calories, another six teaspoons of saturated fat and over 300 milligrams of sodium. So here, one meal, if we go to the kings and the queens there, we've got about 2,500 calories, 25 teaspoons of fat, most of which is saturated, and about 2,500 milligrams of sodium in that one meal. Look at uh, uh, this book by John Love, uh, was written a couple of years ago, called McDonald's Behind the Arches. Uh, Bill Castelli, who heads the Framingham uh, program, talks about McDonald's arches as the entrances into the pearly gates. And uh, I think he's right. Look at some of these. In 1985, 96% of Americans ate at one of McDonald's restaurants. Slightly more than 50% of the population of the USA lives within three minutes of a McDonald's. This is an old slide. McDonald's has served now over 65 billion hamburgers. And think, uh, Think um, how many plaques they've uh, supplied. McDonald's is the biggest uh, purchaser of beef uh, in the world. Uh, nearly all of these fast food chains in the USA purchase their beef from Central America. They're starving down there and they're sending uh, their cows up here. Since 1960, uh, the, central, the uh, uh, rainforest in Central America uh, has uh, really been devastated. It's dropped from approximately 130 square miles uh, to 80,000 square miles of rainforest lost on the planet. A lot of oxygen, a lot of species, and so on. So it's not just a minor a problem we're talking about. McDonald's has employed 8 million workers. 7% of the entire U.S. workforce and McDonald's has replaced the U.S. Army as America's largest job training organization. First job of 15% of Americans is with McDonald's now. Look at this number eight. McDonald's is the world's largest owner of commercial real estate. Now that's power, folks, and that's cardiologic enemy number one as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this fellow, Tom Parker, wrote an interesting book, and that is and that is, what do we in the USA consume every day? And look at this. About 815 billion calories of food are consumed every day, roughly 200 billion more than we need. Those 200 billion would feed the whole country of Mexico every day with no problem. We slaughter nearly 100,000 cattle in this country every day, yielding 60 million pounds of red meat. About 250,000 hogs are slaughtered and butchered every day, and four million pounds of, of bacon are eaten every day. We kill more animals than any, any population ever generated on the planet. We kill about 9,000 animals a day in this country, most of which are chickens. A few turkeys need to be added to this, and uh, goats and uh, sheep and so on. That's nearly three billion a year. Uh, 50, as I understand it, 50% of the pollution of our rivers and streams and lakes are due to the excreter of our livestock. 
Uh, most of the crops grown in this country are not for people, they're for our livestock. 80% of the corn crop in this country goes to the livestock. 95% uh, of the oat crop uh, goes to the livestock. If we weren't feeding our cattle, we could feed five times the human population on the planet. If you don't know what it is, make a hot dog out of it. About 47 million hot dogs are eaten uh, every year. <laughs> McDonald's puts 2,500 cattle on their tables uh, every day. Dairy cows yield 47 million gallons of milk every day. We eat 170 million eggs every day. We eat 50 million pounds of sugar every day, an average of 21 teaspoons apiece. The average American eats his or her body weight in sugar every year. We eat three million gallons of ice cream every day, and there's more sugar and ketchup for our hamburgers and hot dogs than there is in ice cream. And we eat 10 million pounds of candy every day. We drink 16 million gallons of beer and ale. It raises our blood pressure, you know and 1.5 million gallons of hard liquor every day, enough to make 26 million Americans thoroughly drunk every day. We smoke 85 million packs of cigarettes uh, every day. Doctors, it's a wonderful thing. That only 9% of doctors smoke cigarettes now, but we still have 47 million Americans that smoke cigarettes. Now that we all grew up with the National Dairy Council's a nice uh, 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 comments about their uh, produce, drink three glasses of milk every day. Everybody needs milk. Nature's most perfect food, bunk. This is the worst thing we can uh, drink almost. Uh, the whole milk is 50% fat. A uh, so-called low-fat milk, that 2% milk, that's 2% by weight. Milk is 87% water, but that so-called 2% milk is actually 33% uh, 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 fat as a percent of calories. The only good milk is skim milk. We should uh, not, not eat, drink the other. Now, look at this slide and, and just ask the question. If one was a, was a pure vegetarian rather than a meat eater, uh, would these diseases uh, affect the pure vegetarian over many decades? And the answer is no. Uh, if you compare pure vegetarians to ovo uh, vegetarians, uh, to meat-eating people, like most of us are, uh, these conditions are almost exclusively in the meat-eaters. Atherosclerosis, systemic hypertension, cancers of the colon, breast, uterus, ovary, prostate, diabetes, obesity, uh, peptic ulcer, constipation, hemorrhoids, diverticulitis, appendicitis, gallstones, kidney stones, osteoarthritis, even uh, some uh, asthma. Uh, there have been some studies on uh, meat-eating asthma victims becoming vegetarians, and uh, many of the attacks disappear. Uh, our, our society would, would gain a great deal of health if we didn't do that. Now, I snitched this slide from a psychiatrist friend, and he said, told me, that if you show this slide to any group of people, that no matter how much people weigh, that most of the women are going to say they're four or five, and most of the men are five or six. But we know better. Now, look at this. <laughs> In 1988, we reached 60 percent of adult Americans are overweight, 60 percent, three out of every five, and it really doesn't matter what age. 18 to 29, 51 percent overweight, 30 to 39, 53 percent, 40 to 49, 63, 50 to 64, 71, 65, and over 57. The only reason that dropped is these people died. Um, but if one wants, ever, all of us going to die, of course, but if one wants to die sooner than later, the easiest way is to gain weight. Now, this is a slide from uh, the Harvard School of Public Health, and it was published in 1986, and it summarizes 20 studies on the relationship between overweightness and death. And whether one's a man or whether one's a woman, as one increases in weight, 
uh, people die quicker, sooner. As you know, in World War II, there was not a lot of red meat in certain countries in Europe, particularly the Scandinavian countries, and there was not much butter, and there was not much cheese, and there was not much milk. And look what happened to the cardiovascular death rate in some of these countries. In Sweden, boom, it fell in World War II, 39 to 45. In Finland, boom, it fell. In Norway, boom, it fell. Uh, if we are careful about what we put in our mouth, our health will, will skyrocket. Now, Ansel Keys, I consider Ansel Keys a great man. I'm a, really a fan of his. Uh, during World War II, Ansel Keys studied a group of young American soldier boys and put them on a on a 1,700 caloric diet, which he calls semi-starvation diet. And um, this form of cardiovascular therapy is a bit neglected, I'm afraid. But look at some of the good things that this did to these people. Of course, it decreased the body weight, metabolic rate, heart rate, blood volume. There are some pharmaceutical companies that are spending money trying to develop some drugs that will do some of those things. Now, of course, there were some problems. Uh, unremitting hunger, depression, sense of being old, always cold, no interest in sex, etc. I mean, it's a trade-off form of uh, <laughs> uh, therapy, but, but I do think uh, that uh, a little dieting is a, is a bit neglected. In the 1970s, from the cardiovascular standpoint, as you probably know, the, that was a decade of hypertension, the, the push Everybody needs to know their blood pressure, and if it's elevated, uh, get it down. In 1972, only 15% of Americans with hypertension had that blood pressure controlled. In 1988, that percent is up to 57%. And now we're in the midst of a cholesterol era, as the Wall Street Journal calls it. Uh, the push is to get everybody's cholesterol down to less than 200 and know what one's is, and if it's elevated, get it down. I have a suspicion that the 1990s is going to be the era of reversibility of these plaques. And many people, Armstrong and, and Whistler from Chicago and others, have shown that in non-human animals, uh, for example, uh, uh, monkeys and, and rabbits, these atherosclerotic plaques are reversible. Uh, at least the lipid portion is. And we also know from uh, various uh, physiologists that an artery has to be narrowed greater than 75% in cross-sectional area in order for flow to be diminished. And if we can take an artery narrowed to that extent and have that much lipid in it, if we can drop the lipid from this to this, that artery opens up to less than 75% and theoretically flow through that uh, should be normal. Now, there are ways, of course, to get these lipids down, and the number one is diet, and I, all of us should, should be careful about this. American Heart Association has recommended that the percent of calories from fat be dropped from about 40% uh, to 30%. It, in my judgment, it should be dropped to 20%. Uh, here, we also eat too much protein. That's about 15%. Uh, almost surely that should drop down to, uh, uh, to about uh, 8 or 9 percent. Osteoporosis would disappear in women if we didn't eat so much uh, protein, apparently. It's believed that the, the average total cholesterol in adults over 40 in this country is about 215. If it dropped down to that, the average total cholesterol uh, presumably would drop to about 185. Now, there are other ways to get the cholesterol down. Um, I participated in a, a small little doctor study at NIH taking these uh, fish tablets, and those no question, uh, they work. Uh, they'll get the total and LDL cholesterol down a bit. The problem is you got to take one every 15 minutes. And uh, some of, that's really not medicine, it's food. Some of those things have as many as 50 calories in them. Now, fortunately, we've got some uh, uh, good drugs now. In this list of lipid-lowering drugs, I put that in quotation marks because lipid-lowering meaning total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, we want a drug that raises HDL, so it's not all lipid lowering. Now, the bile acid resins are the non-systemic uh, absorbers, of course, uh, and uh, these drugs are very effective. Uh, they drop with maximal doses, 30 grams and 24 grams a day. The total cholesterol, about 17 percent, the LDL, about 23 percent, and they raise the HDL. That's a little wrong there. They have very little effect on the triglyceride levels. Nicotinic acid is a very good drug. If you can take it, I know a fellow in California takes six grams of this stuff a day. 
Uh, I took it to just to see what it was like, and I tell you, I'll never take it again. It'll blow your head off if, you, if you're not careful. But if you can take it, it's, it's, uh, it's very effective. Uh, Gem 5 Brazil and Probucol have relatively modest effects on the total cholesterol and the LDL cholesterol. Probucol, I don't believe this is going to last. It drops that HDL, and it's the only one that drops the HDL. That's obviously a disadvantage. Lovastatin is a new uh, one on the block, and uh, clearly this drug is going to be effective. Uh, there's a lot of push to, to, uh, to combine uh, 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 these drugs uh, now. Uh, some, uh, some of the uh, uh, lipid experts think that's going to be the way to go uh, eventually. Uh, it's fun to take this formula of total cholesterol LDL equals LDL plus HDL plus VLDL and plug in each one of these drugs. You take probucol, well, you're going to raise this one here. Uh, 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 it has uh, virtually no effect on the VLDL or the triglyceride. That's a calculation, triglyceride divided by 5. It lowers this about 8 percent, so you're going to get a reduction uh, in, uh, in total cholesterol of about that. Uh, the lipid uh, research people tell us to base diet therapy, I mean the drug therapy, on the LDL cholesterol level. The problem with it is that the LDL cholesterol has to be done fasting. That has to be done fasting. That has to be done fasting. Whereas the total, which roughly parallels the LDL in most, uh, in most studies, uh, does not have to be fasting. So, uh, it, although everybody with a total cholesterol over 200 uh, should have this breakdown. Uh, I don't think anybody needs it if it's, uh, if it's under 180. A fellow came up to me after a talk a while back and said, said, uh, said my, my HDL is only 20. And I said, well, what's your total? And he said, 140. And I said, well, go home. If the total is, is low, uh, the HDL is probably going to be a little low. Now, let me spend about just a couple minutes on hypertension. When Franklin Roosevelt died in this state in 1945, his blood pressure was 300 over 190. And the reason I show this is to point out, in 1945, there was no therapy for systemic hypertension, at least no drug therapy. And look at the uh, splendid drugs that we have now. Uh, the frequency of stroke is clearly diminishing. I can also tell you that that when Richard Nixon entered office, when Roosevelt entered office, his blood pressure was 120 over 80. And you can see what the office did to him. When Nixon entered office, his blood pressure was 110 over 70. That was in January 1969. When he left in 1973 under some relatively undue circumstances, his blood pressure was 110 over 70. Uh, <laughs> you can conclude what you wish from that one. Uh, Hypertension is just like lipids. The higher the blood pressure, the greater the risk. The risk or seriousness is proportional to the level, and there have been many studies that have shown that. I think it's important to, to mention, and this is from Framingham, that the systolic blood pressure is just as important as the diastolic, and in Framingham, more important. And yet every, every drug uh, treatment uh, study and hypertension has been based on the diastolic level, but one cannot ignore the systolic level. No, no salt, no hypertension. It's clearly uh, salt intake in this country is diminishing. If you've got a salt shaker on your table at home, throw it away. Uh, when you go out somewhere, don't ask to somebody to pass some salt and pepper. Just, just pass the pepper. But we've got to set the example in, in health in this country, or the doctors do to the non-doctors. And don't, we don't need to eat salt. Ed Fries is, uh, is a hypertension person in Washington, and he was the one who really introduced thiazide diuretics for hypertension. He studied some patients in uh, Micronesia in the South Pacific, and, and, and some of those uh, pockets of people in certain islands eat no salt, I mean zero salt, during an entire lifetime. And, and the blood pressure in them at birth is 90 over 60. At 20, it's 90 over 60. At 40, it's 90 over 60. At 60, it's 90 over 60. At 80, it's 90 over 60. Blood pressure should not rise with age. It's just like our body weight in this country it generally goes up with age. Our cholesterol levels go up with age, but they shouldn't. It's not normal. And the hypertension uh, uh, should not be more prevalent, prevalent uh, as we get older, uh, but it is. No salt, no hypertension. 
Cultures whose diets are low in sodium and high in potassium are normal intensive. When people from the above cultures adopt a Western lifestyle, their blood pressure then rises with age and the frequency of hypertension explodes. Uh, this is a slide uh, which shows the effect of some of these uh, antihypertensive agents on blood lipid levels. Uh, this is, uh, is a bit controversial. Ed Fries, for example, thinks that thiazide diuretics, uh, although they erase the total cholesterol and the triglyceride and the LDL cholesterol in the first year of use, go back to baseline after a year. Well, there's a recent study showing at 44 months uh, that they don't go back to baseline. I wouldn't have thiazide diuretics if I had hypertension, if I could afford the others. The beta blockers without intrinsic sympathomimetic activity have a, have a minor adverse effect on blood lipids. Those with intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, the only two, acetabutalol and pendolol, have no detrimental effect. The alpha blockers are the only ones that have favorable effects, although they're relatively minor on lipid levels. The ACE inhibitors and the calcium blockers uh, have um, uh, no adverse effects on lipid levels. Let me finish this by just a few comments on this wonderful paper uh, by uh, 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 Drs. Boyd Eaton and Melvin Connor and Marjorie Shostak, all of your uh, wonderful uh, uh, Emory University. Uh, these people are anthropologists, as you know better than I. Uh, Melvin Sh Connor is a world-renowned uh, 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 anthropologist. He and his wife, Marjorie Shostak, who wrote the word ni book, uh, Nisa, uh, spent two years in, uh, in studying the bush people uh, in Africa, and they think the bush people live like our Stone Age ancestors. Now, all three of these people, and uh, particularly Boyd Eaton, wrote this book recently called The Paleolithic Prescription, published in June 1988. It's one of the best diet books I ever read. I, I really recommend it to you. That article appeared in the April issue, 1988, of the American Journal of Medicine. I think some of their uh, conclusions are very applicable to us today. Many diseases in the late 20th century were uncommon, rare, or non-existent among our Stone Age ancestors. Our genes have not changed since anatomically modern humans became widespread about 30,000 years ago. I mean, 30,000 years ago is nothing. The planet apparently has been here 4.6 billion years. Dinosaurs roamed the planet 150 million years. Here, we've been here as we are today about 35,000 years. Or from a genetic standpoint, current humans are still late paleolithic pre-agricultural hunter-gatherers. Therefore, we have a major mismatch on our hands. In contrast to our genes, our culture, of course, has changed enormously beginning with the agricultural revolution about 500 years, 5,000 years ago. Before the agricultural revolution, human beings did not drink milk or eat cheese or, or, or butter. That only came as we domesticated uh, animals. Uh, the wild animals that these people ate had a lot less fat in it than our domesticated uh, animals and accelerating since the Industrial Revolution, only about 200 years ago. In other words, we have Stone Age bodies in anatomic age. Our remote ancestors had little or no exposure to either tobacco or alcohol. Their lives required both aerobic and resistance exercise, and their nutrition was derived almost exclusively from wild game and uncultivated vegetable foods. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis, and the most frequent cancers, lung, breast, colon, are diseases resulting from our current genetic lifestyle mismatch. This is a diet as predicted uh, by uh, Boyd Eaton and colleagues in the Stone Agers, and this is our contemporary American diet. Uh, fat, about half the fat of, uh, as a percent of calories that we take in, uh, virtually no alcohol, polyunsaturated saturated fat ratio about three to one, cholesterol intake about the same as today, fiber much more uh, in the stone ages, sodium much less, calcium and, and vitamin C much more. The present societies who do not develop atherosclerosis, and there's still a few of them, have low blood cholesterol levels, no hypertension, do plenty of physical exertion, do not use tobacco, and their diets are low in total fat, and have more polyunsaturated than saturated fatty acids. The blood is even thinner than ours. 
I think in this country we say the older we are, the more atherosclerotic plaques we get, and that's unfortunately probably the case, but it doesn't have to be. These are coronary arteries at sites of maximal narrowing in a woman who is 103 years of age. Now look at that left main coronary artery there, just beautiful. This is the worst plaque she had in the whole coronary system. That's the right coronary artery, but look how big it is. Left anterior descending, perfect. I'll trade with that lady right now. Uh, uh, she was run over by an automobile. Uh, Mark Twain hit it on the head, I think. The only way to keep healthy is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. So <laughs> it's up to each one of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. We have questions and comments. Dr. Arensberg. Thank you. That was thoroughly enjoyable, and I'm only saddened that the room isn't more full and people aren't hanging off the rafters. But I do have one question for you as a pathologist. Starting with your first slide, if in fact most of the atheroma is fibrous material and very little of it is lipid, at, at what point does it no longer make sense uh, to try to work on regression? Yeah. Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'll tell you how I look at it. I look at cholesterol as the, so as, maybe as a, almost an enzyme that's turning on this clotting process. I think we're clotting all the time and that most of these plaques are the consequence of that. Uh, in the uh, Lee studies uh, at Massachusetts uh, Technology University up there in Boston, uh, he found that, that in the type 2 hyperlipidemic patients that, that uh, platelet aggregation was tremendously greater in, in those patients with, with high cholesterol levels versus those in low cholesterol levels. Um, so maybe this clotting is going on all the time. Now your other question, uh, when is reversibility uh, no longer uh, useful? Well, I don't know the answer uh, uh, to that question. Uh, it seems to me that, that there's always lipid in most of these plaques, and, it, and if we can get that lipid out of there, almost surely the plaque's going to open up. I mean, when you do a bypass, how much increase of blood are you supplying to myocardium? I mean, I, I, or, or angioplasty. And I, I don't think we're, we're supplying much more, or those that are doing it, I don't think the myocardial blood flow increases greatly. But it increases enough, and it, it takes a patient from inadequate myocardial oxygenation to adequate. It just sort of tips the scales. And uh, maybe some of this reversibility uh, would be the same way. I think the other part of your question is, is whether or not uh, it's advisable to try to lower people's lipids, that is, people in the older age group. And my mother's 85, and I really don't care what her total cholesterol is now. Uh, I wouldn't do anything about it, of course. But the sad thing about coronary disease is the average age of death in men is 60. 60 years of age. And so in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, uh, uh, it's very important. It's not a disease that just kills old people. It's a, it's a disease, at least in men, uh, that kills in the prime of life. Bill, would you care to comment on the studies of Dan Steinberg where in some studies with Probicol they felt that perhaps some of the benefit was not necessarily on the lowering of lipid effects but preventing the LDLs, as it were, from becoming rancid inside the walls of the blood vessels and that there may be some effect at, at that level? Yeah, well, maybe I was too critical of that uh, a drug, Probicol. Uh, I've heard this. and. Uh, it's just an, it's a, it's a new twist. Uh, it, certainly the producer of that drug is, uh, loves that. Uh, whether it's really right or not, I don't know. Additional questions or comments? Or Bill, would you care to comment about the primary prevention uh, or lessening risks of primary disease from drugs such as aspirin, for example? Well, I'm, I, I hate to admit it, but I, I didn't join that uh, uh, physician study on aspirin 
that was uh, sponsored started a few years back because I didn't want to take myself off aspirin. I've been on it 15 years and uh, it seems to me that uh, after looking at thousands of these coronary arteries and plaques that if clotting doesn't have something to do with it, I'm going to be absolutely amazed. Okay. Additional questions or comments from anyone in the audience or on television? If not, we'd like to thank our alumnus, Dr. William Roberts. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Clinical Conference in Cardiology is a weekly presentation of the Department of Medicine, Emory University School of Medicine, and the Emory Medical Television Network, KVI 65 and KVI 66, Atlanta, Georgia.